Yes, uh, welcome everyone. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Ari Costa today as our speaker. So he uh, received his PhD at Maastricht University and uh, afterwards uh, has been at Zuse Institute in Berlin and in uh, University of Warwick. And now he ended up as a mathematics professor at the RWTH Aachen University. Um, so his research is um, focused on integer programming, uh, combinatorial um, polyhedral theory, uh, and a lot of other stuff. Of course, robust optimization. So I'm very happy that you will show us some that you will use your expertise in integer programming uh, to show us how you can use it in robust optimization. Um, yeah, he's part of uh, the editorial board of uh, Informs Journal on Computing. Uh, and also uh, other journals. And yeah, I'm very happy to have him here today. So please, Ari. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to give a presentation about our recent work on robust optimization. It's about 15 years, I would think, that uh, I started to work in robust optimization for network design problems at that time. Um, but in the meanwhile, uh, we moved to other areas and all kinds of optimization problems where we introduce into uncertainty into it. And um, one of the recent works uh, that I will present today are in fact two works um, that are done mainly, the hard work is done by Timo Gessing. I have to say that uh, in the beginning together with uh, Christina Busing, um, we worked on solving robust combinatorial optimization problems where we use the budget uncertainty uh, ID. Um, this makes those problems more difficult to solve, and uh, therefore we try to look at the polyhedral theory again uh, for these kind of problems to look at felt inequalities or also at the branch and bounds strategies that you can solve those problems with. So that's more or less the plan what we're going to do. Um, um, first of all, give you a very brief introduction to have everybody on the same uh, page uh, about combinatorial optimization on the budget of that uncertainty. And then we're going to look at those two uh, different approaches, looking at felt inequalities and looking at a tree search or a branch and bounds uh, algorithm. So what is um, combinatorial optimization in the context of robustness uh, we are looking at? Well, we are looking only at um, uncertainty in the objective function. So we have a minimization problem or a maximization problem where the objective can be uncertain, um, but the combinatorial structure remains the same. That is fixed, so to say. Think of a knapsack problem where the weights are already given, but um, the profits are uncertain. Or a stable set problem, independent set problem where the graph is given, but your weights are not clear yet. Um, so how do we define uh, a robust problem in this case, like uh, Bental and Amorovsky introduced, uh, it's a collection of problems where we have different objective uh, factors C that are coming from this uncertainty set U, which we have to define to look at the problem actually. Um, as we don't have a problem with feasibility of solutions, because we, the combinatorial structure remains the same, we only have to look at the robust solution value that we get. And in the robustness, we would like to find the worst case, in this case, in general, the supremum of the objective function, because we are minimizing it. Um, so the robust counterpart, as it's called, uh, is minimizing this robust solution value subject to that a vector x is coming from the combinatorial structure, the binary structure in particular here we are looking at, we have the yes, no decisions, we have zero or ones for all variables. And uh, as I said, well, the uncertainty set, that's of course an important feature we are looking at. And uh, one of the most successful uncertainty sets was introduced for 20 years now by Betsy Mas and Sim. Um, which is called gamma robustness or budgeted uncertainty. Uh, and it looks like the following, which you see here. Um, you have a parameter gamma, which you can play with and uh, make it less conservative or more conservative, what you're looking at. Uh, and for the objective, it means that the, we consider all possible objective functions that have the following structure. 
you have a nominal value C bar for every coefficient, and you have a deviation C hat for the coefficients that can be added to this uh, coefficients with a multiplication of a delta where the delta comes from zero or one. So you can deviate up to this deviation value. That's the maximum deviation you have. But you cannot have them all of them at the same time at the maximum. Only gamma of them can be at the most at the same uh, at the maximum deviation, or you can have half half deviations or things like that. That's the idea of the uh, gamma robustness which we have here. And this gamma, as I said, is a parameter you can play with. It starts with zero. It can be going up to n. It can be any arbitrary value, but usually we use only integer values here. Uh, to have a little bit more control, so to say, uh, on this problem. Um, if you now look at uh, the solution uh, or the solution value of a solution X that is coming from my uh, solution set, and I have, in fact, a gamma equal, uh, an integer gamma, and then you can compute the robust solution value of this uh, solution by just adding up the nominal values for those that are equal to one. And in addition, you have to select a subset that is at most gamma elements for which the deviations are the highest you can think of. Um, so you take the maximum over all possible subsets of your uh, variable set, uh, and then you sum up the deviations times xi in this case. Say it a bit differently. If I look at the combinatorial optimization problem in the nominal case, uh, you can formulate it typically the following way. You have this objective function and you have a number of constraints that model you. Uh, combinatorial structure together with the integer, the binary decision variables. The binary, that's the important thing. We are talking about binary programming here, combinatorial uh, structures in that sense. If we now say, okay, the coefficient of the objective can be in a certain interval that goes from the nominal value minus the deviation until the nominal value plus the deviation, uh, you should replace the objective, of course, uh, by a real value that it makes sense there. And the very conservative way would be taking everywhere the maximum value of those intervals um, so that you get a very conservative approach to the objective. Um, but also in that sense robust, and uh, you will be sure that your solution value will be at most this value uh, which you get there. The idea of Bessimus and Sim is that to make it less conservative by saying not all of them can be going to the maximum value, but you can at most have comma of them and that deviate at the same time and the other ones stay at the nominal value. And there you have again, so to say, this maximum that we are talking about. Um, so we have a minimization with a maximum inside. And um, the nice thing is that this maximum can be formulated as a linear program. In fact, it's an integer linear program with a total union bottom matrix. And you can then um, use the relative theory to make a minimization problem out of it. Then you have two minimizations and you can leave out one of the minimizations to make a nice compact reformulation of the problem. So we have a variable z that is uh, uh, related to this constraint that you can have at most gamma deviations. And you have variables pi for every xi, you have one of those variables. And together, they must be at least the deviation times the xi decision variables uh, in your solution. The difference is that the gamma uh, the, is in front of the z, so you pay for the z gamma times um, what you pay for the PIs. If you look at this, um, it's just a linear addition to the model. So if you have an integer linear program, you only get a linear number of constraints in addition to uh, a number of linear constraints in, in, in addition to it and a number of variables that are continuous uh, to the model. So it will give you a moderate increase, increase in the complexity. If your problem was polynomial, time solvable, then it still remains polynomial time solvable. Um, and you would think also that it does not make that much impact maybe on those uh, real binary problems that you have. Um, you have compact formulation. You don't use any big M's that you have sometimes in linearization of quadratic functions or things like that. Um, 
everything looks pretty good. But what is the practical performance that you have here? So we tested this uh, because we observed it in other cases, but we started to look at uh, small problems. Uh, on a knapsack problem, we have only 50 items. So if you have a knapsack problem with 50 items in a nominal case, the deterministic case, uh, it solves with uh, standard solvers in about one or two seconds usually. It's NP complete, but it's not difficult to solve for that. Now we added the uh, gamma robustness to it. And you see here a part of the log file. After an hour, uh, we have still, we have uh, used 24 million nodes in the brains and bound tree. And there are still 50 million left over to explore. And you have a gap of um, almost 6% left. But the nominal case was only one, two seconds. Here you have uh, one hour already uh, consumed and not in for going far. So what's going on here? Why is it so difficult? We try to understand what is uh, here the problem that it uh, becomes that much more complicated. So we look at the model again. Um, we have those additional variables, Z and PI in the objective. And in this constraint, there you say the deviation must be covered by those variables. So if you now look at a fixed X variable, then uh, you can say, OK, let's sort the deviations times the XIs from large to small. So I just sorted them over here. And um, we know that they have to be covered by the variable Z plus the PI. And in the objective, they gave you gamma times Z plus the sum of the PIs. So if I now pick a variable Z, uh, a value Z, and um, I can see, well, the gamma, if it's an example equals to three, that gives me, so to say, the volume uh, of this blue part as the uh, contribution to the objective function. But by the constraints, I also know that, well, together with the PI, it must be the whole bar that I see here uh, in the picture. So for all of them that are above the Z value, I have to add a P value that is not zero. So I get those values in addition uh, to them. Um, and I get in total objective, the blue part plus the red part, if I take pick the Z value as I have chosen here. Well, you see that I, I'm doing a little bit, that's too fast. I'm doing a little bit too much over here because there is no blue below and I still have need the red over here. If I increase my Z value, I can get rid of those uh, parts of the red part. But if I go too far, then my blue part will be like coming larger. And here I have, in fact, for the third uh, variable, too much taken. Um, so I would like to move it a little bit down again so that it gets uh, exactly the parts that are the bars of the first three uh, variables over here. So anywhere between uh, this value over here and this value over here, so that's the gamma largest value and the gamma plus one largest value will suffice uh, uh, to get the optimal value of this part of the objective function. And that's an interesting observation, uh, which will help us in different ways and which was also observed already by, uh, by Betsimas and Sim uh, in their paper. Um, so that, that's one thing we already know, but does that explain why the LP relaxation is that bad that it takes so long that to solve the branch and bound uh, tree of the problem? Well, for that, we made an even easier problem than a knapsack problem. We looked at the following problem, selecting the smallest weight of a vector, the smallest element in a vector, so to say. Uh, well, you can write it down as a linear program, but it looks... Uh, rather ridiculous maybe, um, because you just can pick it, so to say. Um, and I make it even simpler, the weights are just uniform. So all they have is just the same value, so I can pick any of them and that would be okay. Now I have to introduce robustness uh, to this problem. So I'm going to deviate all those weights, um, but I'm going to deviate them with a uniform weight as well. So all items or all variables have the same deviation C hat over here. And I get this introduction of those dual variables in my formulation. If I look at this model, well, I have to still to pick the one that is the smallest 
because I'm only going to pick one of the items I have. Well, that means that any solution will do any zero one vector with only one one in it, uh, and you get a solution value of uh, c bar plus c hat, the blue plus the red area in this picture as well. If you now, however, try to solve the linear relaxation, what you will observe, because they are all the same, is that it um, just takes every item one over n times. So you get small values over here. That means that the x variable is small and that you can do with a small z value all of them at the same time. So the z value will be equal to um, c hat divided by n as well. And uh, you get only this part in the objective which you see here. That means you get in the LP relaxation c, uh, c bar still, what you get c hat divided by n. And now if you um, set c bar equal to zero, you see that the difference between those two uh, is one over n, so to say, you get an exponential behavior uh, or an arbitrary large gap between the two values. And that's exactly what happens in many of those uh, robust uh, optimization problems. The influence of the uncertainty vanishes in the LP relaxation. So that's an error problem we see here. It diversifies, and by that you get less of your uncertainty in the objective. That's what we like uh, to uh, resolve by following one of the following strategies. And the first thing I would like to uh, talk about is that we're going to look at valid inequalities that we know from the nominal problem, and we're going to do a kind of recycling of those uh, valid inequalities uh, to get new inequalities for the robust problem. So look again at uh, this model, we had the, compact, uh, the, the robust counterpart with the dual variables inside here. Well, if you look at the nominal case, you just have in a uh, combinatorial optimization a number of constraints that give you the structure of the combinatorial problem, ax equal to equal to b, and you have the binary decision variables and the polyhedron that belongs to it is then the convex hull of those constraints uh, with the zero one vectors. And in many cases for the classical problems from TSP, NAPSEC and uh, stable set, uh, we know a lot of federal inequalities for those kind of problems. And they are typically written down as pi x times uh, less than or equal to pi zero uh, in a general format. But what do we know about the robustification of this polyhedron? So the introduction of the Z and the P variables in addition to the X variables. So we have again the AX trade equal to B inside uh, my inequalities, but we have those additional inequalities over here and those additional variables uh, that are non-negative. Well, of course, those inequalities still remain valid for the problem because they were valid for AX trade equal to B, and so they will still be here. But there will be something more, of course. We have new variables, we have new constraints connecting those different variables. Um, so how do the inequalities for this polyhedron look like? Well, Atom Turk did a first approach in 2006 uh, to look at uh, this uh, polyhedron. Um, but he said, well, I don't know how A greater or equal to B looks like, so I forget about this part. And I'm going to derive inequalities just for the robustification of the problem, so to say. Um, nice uh, inequalities, but uh, they have a limited uh, performance in improvements on this. What we are going to do is, is we're going to look at those inequalities that we know for the combinatorial optimization problem at hand um, of this general form at pi x less than or equal to pi zero, and we're going to do what we call recycling them. So we have given a valid inequality, now written down a little bit more in detail, that we have pi i times x i for all the variables less than or equal to pi zero, and the only thing that I require is that all the values, all the coefficients on the left side are greater or equal to zero in this case. Pi zero is also then greater or equal to zero because the variables are zero over. Such an inequality we call recyclable. 
And why do we call it a recyclable co course? We can use this to derive the following inequality. Um, first of all, we look at this inequality that comes from the dualization of uh, the robustness. And uh, that was looking at like pi plus c greater or equal to the deviation times xi. But what I did, I introduced on the left side multiplication of xi times z. That's a bilinear constraint. Yes, that's not linear anymore. Um, but that's for the moment not that a problem. Um, if I know that I have a binary decision variable, then nothing happened in fact for this constraint in some sense. If xi is equal to zero, then both are equal to zero and the pi, pi i says only that it must be non-negative, that's okay. If xi is equal to one, then you can forget it on this side again and you have the old constraint back as you had it before. So this bilinear constraint is valid and it gives you in fact, um, if you would add this constraint to my example, that uh, the LP relaxation, then the bilinear relaxation becomes equal to the integer solution. Um, but I'm going to take this constraint and I'm going to do a quadragomery like uh, adding up of constraints with different weights. And I take the weights from my original inequality for my nominal problem for the combinatorial optimization problem. I take non-negative weights from them. Um, so I can add up this, all those constraints to the following constraint you'll see over here. And uh, you take this left side is multiplied by pi i. And on the right side, you add all the right hand sides with pi i's. Well, on the left side, you see that the z is everywhere in every of those sum. So we can split the sum in two sums and then add the uh, move the z in front of the second sum over here. So I have pi times pi i, and I have pi i times xi, and that's multiplied with z in the total sum. But exactly this sum over here, we know from the combinatorial optimization problem where it says that that sum is less than or equal to pi zero. So looking at this sum, I can bound it from above by this pi zero. So in some way, I go more to the left and put here a less than or equal sign or a greater or equal effect um, and replace it by the pi zero. By that, I get rid of my bilinearity in linearity in the constraint, I get a linear constraint again. So I replace the sum by the pi zero, and that's exactly now an inequality that is valid uh, for my problem. On the left, we have pi i, pi, we have z times pi zero, and on the right, we have the pi i's times the deviations times the xi. And that's the inequality that we call a recycled inequality because you see that you have used exactly this inequality, whatever the inequality was, as long as the coefficients are non-negative to this, to obtain this inequality. And we have seen that it is valid for our problem because we did nothing else than adding up constraints that are valid for the problem and then um, relaxing it a bit more to obtain a linear inequality. So let's look at a very simple example. If I have two variables that should be less than or equal to one, um, then what happens? Well, I added just for clarity a one in front of them that are the pi one and the pi two coefficients. The blue one is the pi zero coefficients. And if I recycle them, I find back all those coefficients two times, the ones for p one and x one, for p two and x two, and the blue one, the pi zero, is in front of the z variable. And that's a valid inequality for my robust problem. Of course, we can ask, well, are those inequalities any, of any interest? Because yeah, there happened something, but not that much, you could, might think. Um, well, first of all, those inequalities can be anything where you start with um, there can be inequalities from the constraint matrix that you have, your AX less than or equal to B. Um, that can be some classical uh, valid inequalities for your problem that you usually uh, use in a separation procedure, a cutting plane. 
uh, like clique inequalities for independent set or comp inequalities for TSP or something like that. Um, or it can be, and that's very nice, it can be a combination of inequalities that you might not use uh, in recycling because they have negative coefficients. Think of this inequality where you have a negative minus one in front of the X2. Well, recycling said all the coefficients must be greater or equal to zero. But if you combine this inequality together with an inequality X2 plus X3 less than or equal to one, then the X2 is gone in this one, and I get an inequality X1 plus X3 is less than or equal to one. That was, would be usually a redundant inequality for my problem, uh, but I can recycle it, and it gives me a valid inequality for the robust problem. So what we can do, in fact, is that we take all those inequalities that have been derived in the last 20, 30, 40 years for different problems, and we could look if we can recycle them for the robust version of those problems. Those inequalities are, in fact, also facet defining in many cases, in surprisingly many cases, I would say. Um, yeah, facet is uh, the most strong inequality you can have for a um, polyhedron um, because it describes a part of the uh, facet structure of the polyhedron, um, which we would like to have to solve just the problem as a linear program. Think of the robust knapsack for um, problem, for example. So we have given a knapsack problem with items you would like to fill in the capacity. And what we all have seen uh, earlier is that if you look at knapsacks and you have a number of items or a subset of the items that does not fit in the knapsack, you can define a so-called minimal cover inequality that tells you, well, they don't fit all of them in the knapsack, so I can take at most one less than the number of items that I have. Um, and that gives me a valid inequality, but this inequality is in some sense uh, facet defining in special cases, but not in general for the facet, uh, for the knapsack polyton. So if we look at um, this case, well, you have to do some uh, extension or lifting of the cover inequality to get an inequality that is uh, facet defining for the total knapsack. Uh, but that's not what we are going to do. We're going to recycle it, and then it becomes always facet defining. You can show that uh, for the robust version, even if it was not facet defining for the original problem. Same for the robust independent set or stable set problem. Um, what we, we know about this problem, well, we know that we have clique inequalities that tells us at most one vertex from a clique can be taken in a stable set or independent set. And in fact, if these cliques are maximal, they define facet defining inequalities. But if the clique is not maximal, like this red one, you can extend it with the black uh, vertex. Um, it's not a facet defining inequality. In the picture, you also see that it's only giving this connection between two dots uh, or two vertices of the polyhedron and not a whole face or facet. Um, Nevertheless, if you uh, recycle this inequality, it becomes facet defining regardless if it's maximal or not the click you're looking at. And that's because if you look at how it works, is that um, in fact, you have this polyhedron for the uh, independent set problem, but you will project it on the variables that are having positive coefficients in the constraint. And there it is a facet defining inequality. That inequality you recycle and then you get the inequality that is facet defining for the robust version. And it's even more interesting that there are uh, equalities in your problem that might be facet defining in the robust version of the problem after recycling, of course, that's what I mean. Okay, let's look at how it performs in practice. Um, we looked at the maximum weighted bipartite matching problem because that's a problem that's polynomial time solvable. Um, matching on a bipartite graph, and we know exactly how the constraints look like for um, the polyhedron that belongs to it. That are just the constraints you see over here that you say, okay, I can take at most one edge uh, from the edges incident to a vertex um, at every vertex. That's all you have for the polyhedron there. So we can recycle those inequalities and uh, see what it does for our problem if we look at the robust version of it. 
So we constructed a number of instances um, and we set a time limit of 3,600 seconds and one hour. And first of all, if you try to solve those problems, you see the same as with the robust knapsack in the beginning, a little bit better because you can still solve them if you have 50 nodes in your matching. But as soon as you have already 100 nodes in the matching, yeah, you are running out of time in five of the 10 cases we tried. And also interesting is that the integrality gap is here already about 20% uh, the LP compared to the integer program. And for 200 nodes, we could not solve any of the problems in one hour time. But if we include the recycled inequalities um, to this problem, the picture looks a lot different. You see, first of all, that the integrality becomes, uh, gap becomes less than 1% uh, for all those instances. We could solve almost all of them, only the largest ones, there was three out of 10 that could not be solved within an hour. And, and you see the computation time dropped heavily from 600 seconds to four or five seconds, uh, for example, for 100 nodes. We also tried this on um, MIPLIP instances, which uh, we selected that have this combinatorial structure in the problem. That means we have binary decision variables that appear in the objective and we robustified those uh, instances uh, to see if they have the same performance improvements um, on it. In total, we made 804 instances uh, out of it, and uh, three quarters of them were affected by the recycling. We had an integrality gap change for them. And if you look at the change of the integrality gap, um, let's look at 50% reduction of the integrality gap by recycling inequalities. That is the case for about 50% of our instances. So for 300 of those instances, we got a reduction of the integrality gap by at least 50%. For some of them, we even got an integrality redu gap reduction of 100%. So it was closed completely. Um, looking at the solving time, uh, it also worked pretty well. Uh, you could say that, well, for those instances that were affected by recycling, where it really works, the solving time was reduced by about 60%. In general, it was about 45% on average. Okay, that was the recycling part. Um, but we also look at a different way to look and deal with the problem, which is a tree search or branch and bound uh, algorithm. For that, we go back again to this compact reformulation, and we would like to look at what Betsy Mas and Sim already did also. What happens if I fix uh, the value of z to a certain value? Well, by the constraint z plus pi greater or equal to the deviation times xi, we know that the pi variable must be at least in this value minus the z value. And because in the objective, we minimize the sum of the PI values, and you will put it exactly on the value that you get here from the difference from C hat times X minus the Z value that is fixed, except for if it becomes negative, then you put it equal to zero because you need a non-negative value. And now again, by the binary property of the variable, I can move this XI outside so that I have the uh, c hat minus the z value, if that becomes negative, it will be zero, otherwise it will be just a value and that multiplied with xi. This value I can put in the objective over here, I can replace pi by those values and I get an objective that has only the variables xi in it and this fixed z value, so that is not really to all be optimized over here. So I have again, the, object, uh, the nominal problem back here, um, but with a different objective function. But for that, I need to know what the Z value is in the optimal solution. How can I know that? Well, we, we know that it will be, without loss of generality, the gamma largest value of this sorting of the values that you get if you have a given a vector X. However, you don't know what the vector X is, but the X will be zero or one. So they are either one time the deviation or it will be zero over here. Um, and for that, you can conclude that the optimal value will be without loss of generality, one of the deviation values 
or zero if you don't have enough deviations in the solution uh, in the end. So that tells already that we can solve this problem by just solving n plus one nominal problems if the number of variables is equal to n. Um, and there was an improvement uh, 10 years ago um, that you can do even less of them, n minus gamma divided by two plus one, roughly. Um, so that's one side of the coin. And we would like to look at this a bit more, which values we have to take here. Um, but there is also these strong formulations of atom torque that I already mentioned. He had different ones. Um, and they have the property that if you have a nominal formulation that is pretty good, then those strongest form the strongest formulation will be uh, of the same uh, quality. Our bilinear cases that we looked at previously, sorry, no, um, those formulations are, however, becoming very large and too large for practical purposes, I have to say. But now we also looked at this bilinear constraints already in the recycling case, and we can replace the constraint here with this bilinearity z times xi. And if we look at this formulation, then we will see that it is in fact as strong as the strongest formulation of atom torque for this problem. But it's bilinear, it's not a linear formulation. Um, we would like to uh, use, however, this bilinearity of the problem uh, of this formulation in our algorithm in a branch and bound fashion. For that, we look at the following situation. Uh, let's consider that the xi is fixed for a moment, and then look at those two constraints, the bilinear constraint and the linear constraint that we had previously. Well, the linear constraint gives you then in the diagram you see here that you have z and pi given gives you this constraint that the p must be above this line um, if z has a certain value of p. Whereas the bilinear constraint tells me that it must be above the line where we have the green area. So this red area is what we lose with the linearization of this constraint or the linear relaxation. If we now already know the z value is not given exactly, but it is between certain values, so let's say in a lower and upper bound, then we know that we have this too much in comparison to what we really need for the p values. Um, however, if you look at this picture, you can um, find two more constraints that make it better to, uh, to improve on this area, the red area that we don't want to have. First of all, you can move this constraint, so to say, a little bit up so that you get a constraint in the following way um, that it cuts off this part over here. That is, you take the non uh, the bilinear constraint, you replace the z value by the lower bound, but you add then the difference to the lower bound in addition to it. This is a linear constraint now because you have just a lower bound, not the variable over. And also the upper bound gives me something because the upper bound says, well, if I have already taken the upper bound to z bar, then I know that the pi will be at least the difference of those two values times xi. So that is this horizontal line in addition. So I can get rid of this part of the uh, relaxation and only keep this small part that is left over. Of course, it looks smaller than it is maybe. Um, but in particular, if I look at the lower bound and the upper bound, I am and at the points that are really feasible there. Um, they are as strong as the bilinear constraint. And that's what we're going to exploit in a branch and bound algorithm. So we solve the LP relaxation, but we don't come to a branch on the X variable that are the binary variables, but we're going to branch on the Z variable which is in fact a continuous variable. We don't need any integrality for this variable. Nevertheless, we're going to brand them because we know, well, the Z variable is coming from a certain set. So the Z will be in between the smallest and the largest value in this set um, that we have. And now we can say, okay, we're going to branch on, for example, the Z is less than or equal to the seventh element and or at least the eighth element in the set. They are sorted in that way. Um, 
So we get a smaller set on the left and a smaller set on the right, um, a smaller interval. And this interval now gives us the possibility to get additional cuts uh, in the model. If you have the upper bound, you get this cut in addition to it. If you have a lower bound, you can introduce this inequality to the model in addition to it. And by that, we get better uh, bounds on our smaller problems. We do that continuously until we are in some point where we have only one value of z left over. And for that, then we have the nominal problem that we can solve, um, well, as a linear integer linear program, depending on the situation. Let's say that we have here a solution of five and we are minimizing. Well, then we can get rid of the other ones and that we have here with 10 and six because they have a higher value and so are minimizing anyway. So we do pruning. Um, so the idea is that we only consider promising nominal problems in the end, not all of n plus one, but only those that follow from this range and bound algorithm. Doing a lot of engineering work to get this, uh, this working um, by introducing additional uh, node selection rules, inequalities of optimality cuts, and so on. Um, we got an algorithm that performs pretty well uh, on the instances you have seen before, the MIPLIP instances uh, that were robustified for this uh, problem setting. So what we did, we compared, in fact, uh, five different approaches. The Betsimus and Sim compact reformulation that we worked with all the time uh, is called ROP. Then you can do a separation procedure instead of this dualization um, by Betsimus and Sim. You can use if there are the, the nominal subproblems that I introduced here one more time, that you have n plus one of them that you can solve. Um, and the last one we compare with is an algorithm of Hans Knecht et al. They did more or less similar things, but then for the shortest path problem, but you can generalize them to general integer programs uh, or binary programs. Uh, they do a divide and conquer. Um, I'm not going to into details there, but uh, it does a little bit this way, but also different ways. And our brains and bounds. And what you see is that uh, if you look at the time uh, to solve those instances, um, so we have here the time up to one hour, and then the number of instances that are solved within this time limit. Uh, you see that our branch and bound performs very well compared to the other algorithms. We could solve about 85% of the instances in within one hour, whereas the other one um, go up to 55% or less. The separation procedure in particular is uh, about 30% only solved in this time. For those uh, for those instances that they will not solve within the hour, we can still look at the integrality cap or the optimality cap at the end of the hour. What we see here is also that we get a much better um, gap performance, so to say almost all of them are already within 2% gap and they are roughly almost within 10% uh, gap for all of them. That brings me more or less to the end, which uh, fits very well, it looks like. Um, so what can we conclude from these works uh, is the following. Well, first of all, the conclusion is not uh, this, but uncertainty slow down the solution process significantly if you use these approaches like budgeted uncertainty in your model. Uh, but we can find a uh, more effective way or a more efficient way to solve those problems if we do either this tailored branch and bound algorithm where we branch on the Z variable in the problem instead of the binary variables, um, or if we introduce uh, additional inequalities to the problem, the so-called recycled and invalid inequalities, um, where we can use all those that we know already from previous work. Well, we did that for a few problems, but you can, of course, look more into detail uh, and for, for example, the robust TSP problem, if you can do the recycling there for those problems, for the inequalities you have available there and how they look like, if that makes sense there uh, to get a performance improvement. 
What also will be interesting is, of course, that the two approaches are presented could be combined the branch inbound and the recycling of the inequalities to get an even better performance of the algorithms. Uh, we didn't do that so far. The inequalities that we recycled so far are those with non-negative uh, coefficients on the left-hand side. Um, but there are, of course, inequalities that have negative coefficients. So we are also looking into ways uh, to recycle also those inequalities. Because if you really look at a robust polyhedron, you will see that there are many, many more inequalities that we don't know how to explain yet uh, for the problem that we have. And yeah, that's bringing me to the end. Uh, I thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, welcome.